There are iconic images that come to mind when we hear the word Christmas. Snow-laden cottages with wreaths on the doors. People bustling about shopping for that perfect gift. Decorated trees surrounded by presents. But all around us we find glimpses of the significance of God taking on flesh. And from those images we better understand the eternity-changing effect of Emmanuel, God with us. The fact that He was a long-awaited Savior. The reality of Him being a ransom for a world held hostage to sin. The great news of Him being the light that conquered our darkness. These are the images that truly represent what happened on a lonely night in Bethlehem when God decided to break into our world. All right, good stuff. Well, we're excited that you're here today in this series that we call Glimpses this Christmas season. You're in week two, even though it's week three of the month, because last week we had an amazing kids' Christmas musical. Can we thank all those involved one more time? It's so good. <clears throat> And I not only want to thank them, but I want to thank you because you did a great job being very conscious of people in your world who would love coming to this musical as an entry point event, whether it be the, the families connected to the musical who brought family members and coaches and teachers, but also just as a part of our Trinity family, if you knew families with especially young kids, you thought what a great connect that would be and it was. And so I appreciate you being uh, on mission. Well, a couple of things as we get started today, you have a Trinity this week, I forgot to bring mine up with me, but number one, if you take a look inside, you'll see a set of notes for today that we're gonna use to fill some uh, blanks in, so have those out ready to go. If you have a Bible today, book Bible, electronic Bible, if you'd open it to 1 John chapter four, 1 John's all the way at the back of, the, of your Bible, the New Testament. And here's the help for today in finding it. It comes right before 2 and 3 John. Hmm. Never say I wasn't being helpful, all right? Find your way there and we'll be set. Another thing uh, within your Trinity this week, open that up to the middle and you'll see right to the left-hand middle idea is just kind of our um, giving. We kind of have that very... Um, transparent about that. We just want to keep people aware where we're at. And we're on a good pace to finish up this calendar year. The reason I wanted you to know that is some of you um, want to, for good reason, for tax purposes, make sure that you give a gift at the end of this calendar year. Just make sure that it's uh, either to the church or postmark by December 31st. December 31st is even on a Sunday this year, so it makes that very easy. We just want to make sure that you're aware of that so that a gift you give later would be able to count for this year, so just that you're uh, in tune. But we're grateful for your generosity and the way you've given, and again, the Advent Conspiracy. What a great testimony. All of those funds received are simply so we can give them away. And what a great attitude and heartbeat on your part to want to give that way. So we applaud that. We're grateful for such generosity at Trinity. Well, we're going to um, dial in today. <clears throat> As we do, you just have to know um, that for Joanna and I, we are people who love Christmas. Even the fact that we got married right around Christmas. Some of you are paying attention on social media with way too many selfies. We celebrated our 25th anniversary this last weekend. <clears throat> and it's a great milestone. It's wild. We were sitting there looking at each other like only old people have been married 25 years. What's going on? It's crazy. But um, we're really grateful, and I remember our wedding. Uh, we got married in a church up in Ukaipa, and the, the whole stage was filled with Christmas trees and white lights. We just love this time of year. We love it as well related to Christmas music. So much so, in our home, it used to begin around Thanksgiving, but actually it goes now the whole month of November. All we listen to from November all the way to December is Christmas music. My kids will even have earbuds in, and my wife will walk up to them, what are you listening to? Nope, it's not Christmas, change it. And that's kind of how we roll. So we have this great sense, and it was a, a song that has become more popular in the last few years that its lyrics, I felt like, really set the stage for where we're going today. It's a song called A Strange Way to Save the World. And in it, it's from the perspective of Joseph, 
who, who must have been just completely confused as to what is going on. This woman that he's pledged to be married to has never been with physically, but is giving birth to a child, and he's supposed to be the anointed Messiah. What on earth is happening? And these are some of the lyrics <clears throat> from that song. To think of how it could have been if Jesus had come as he deserved, there would have been no Bethlehem, no lowly shepherds at his birth. But Joseph knew the reason love had to reach so far as he held the Savior in his arms, he must have thought, why me? I'm just a simple man of trade. Why him with all the rulers in the world? Why here in this stable filled with hay? Why her? She's just an ordinary girl. Now, I'm not one to second guess what angels have to say, but this is such a strange way to save the world. And it's through that lens today that I want to investigate this idea of Jesus and his arrival, his incarnation. We'll use that word a lot today. The incarnation simply means coming in the flesh. God with us, Emmanuel, coming among us, not faking it, but being fully God and fully human all at the same time. That is the person of Jesus that we celebrate this Christmas season. So as we look into this idea of it today, my hope is this. I want to do two things. Number one, I want to refresh and reinvigorate your um, understanding of God's love for you. I want you to see in a very fresh way today what it meant for God to say he loves you. The second thing I want you to see is the incredible opportunity that we have to live out the example of Jesus, to be incarnational in our lives, in our world, just like he was in ours. And so I'm excited to go there today. This picture today is going to represent what we're looking at. Remember this series, Glimpses? We kicked it off a couple weeks ago. We went back to um, this iconic uh, toy that kind of transports you to different worlds just by being able to look at different pictures. And we said that maybe this story from 2,000 years ago, though very rich and complete in what it is, maybe there are pictures in our world today that actually remind us of what was going on there, maybe even give us a new lens to look through, as it were. So today we're looking, if you notice the message titled today, we're talking about a ransom, a ransom for hostages. And this is an example maybe of what you might consider a hostage note to look like. The picture on the screen is actually from a very real hostage situation at a mall in Nairobi, Kenya in 2013. This really happened. These are not actors. And we'll talk about the image a little bit more, but to me, it captures a very powerful picture of what was going on on that starry night in Bethlehem. The now what idea today that we want to look at and walk away with today is simply this. It's in your notes on the screen. As Jesus came to set hostages free, so take that great news to the hostages that are in your world. Number one in your notes today, the incarnation was necessary. The incarnation was necessary. I want to explore this a little bit with you today. Take a look. This is the image from the video that you saw as we kicked off the series again today, our bumper video. This picture of the manger is the one that we inserted in there. And, and it's a great picture. It's very artistic. It's very beautiful. There's a lot more going on in that picture than probably what the shepherds encountered, right? This incredible angelic choir shouting to them the goodness of God. They run to Bethlehem. They see something a little less artistic see than that. They see a woman, a man, and an infant, a newborn. But what this picture is trying to encapsulate is this is often what we do in our artistic renderings of trying to capture what was going on at Jesus's birth. Today, what I want to do is I want to, I want to ask you to look through maybe a little bit of a different lens. Something about the manger, something about the way that it has become so known to many of us, I think we lose something on the sentiment. We lose something on the familiar, even though to an unbelieving world, it's just crazy in and of itself. 
But for those of us who've been around a little bit of following Jesus and had a few Christmases under our belts, we lose something what's going on there. And today what I want to ask you to do is this. I want you to instead, I want you to go there. I want you to go under the tape. I want you to hear the sirens that are blaring. I want you to feel the heat of the sun bearing down on you. I want you to feel the fear as men that you don't know are shouting out orders, telling you what to do. I want you to sense the unrest as people are wondering what is going to happen next. How is the story going to unfold? I want you to sense just the gripping terror of men walking around with automatic weapons and having no idea what they're going to do with them. That was the hostage situation in Nairobi, but I think that was actually what God saw when he sent his one and only son into our world 2,000 years ago. He saw a hostage situation where sin was holding in captivity all of humanity. And the only way that a ransom was going to be paid, the only way a ransom was going to truly set people free was by his son entering in under the tape and becoming one of us to rescue us. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit today. That's the scene I want in your mind <clears throat> and on your brain as we look at this reality. This is the world. This is what Jesus entered into. In your notes, take a look. Humanity was being held captive, waiting until the right ransom arrived. The Bible would tell us Though that's not what we saw in our manger scene images, that the world was being held ransom until the right, until held captive until the right ransom arrived. Your Bibles are open to 1 John chapter 4. Take a look at verse 9. It says this, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. When we think about this Christmas season, so often there are so many distractions. But what I want you to laser focus in on today is this, that the way that God saw the world from his vantage point was anything but this sentimental, serene scene on a hillside. I want you to see that for centuries, humanity, because of its own choice, had decided to defy their creator and then reap the results of that, the consequence of living in and in a sinful place. Sin had done something. It had absolutely ruined what God had put in order. But here's the wild thing. When we see it from that perspective, we hear the word ruined and we look at it as though that must have been um, a curveball to God. Like he didn't see that one coming. He puts Adam and Eve in this garden and gives them the choice to love him in obedience or not. And oh my word, they chose not to. What am I going to do now? The Bible teaches anything but. Because here's maybe the question that you rightfully have in your mind. Todd, why was there even a hostage situation? Why did God allow there to be a scenario in which humanity would be held by sin? Why couldn't have God done something different? And I want to tell you real honestly today, he could have. If we believe that God is the God presented in scripture, there's nothing restraining him. There's nothing that keeps him from doing and being anything he wants to be. So here's the wild thing. Track this for just a minute today. God sees every single option available When he is breathing, speaking the world into existence, he sees every option available. He sees every scenario unfold. And in the middle of all those choices, he chooses what we're living in today. He chooses to create a world in which people had the choice to love him or not. Now, a lot of us struggle with that. If we were in God's shoes, we'd have done something very different. And here's how I know that. Every parent in the room 
knows what I'm talking about. You would love to have a child who says, yes, mommy, yes, daddy, whatever you say. And when I answer, I'll do it with a smile. <laughs> right? We, we'd love to have given birth to automatons who just do whatever we want them to do and they're obedient and they're kind and they get their act together. We would love that. And if you have a child at home who's not that, you'd love that exchange. If you have three or four at home who are not like that, you'd love to exchange them all. God, I just want obedience. But you would be short-sighted if you chose that. It might be helpful in a moment or a season of frustration, but you'd be short-sighted because what you would be giving up in that exchange is the opportunity for your children to love you. You'd be giving up in that exchange the opportunity for you to love your children. Watch this. Nobody, nobody, not even God himself, can make you love him. Love is nothing that can be extracted from anyone. Love, by definition, has to be willfully given. And therefore, God creates a world in which you and I have a will. We have the ability to choose to engage and respond to him in love and obedience or not. And God says the scenario that ultimately is for everyone's best, for God's glory, for our best, is to create a world in which all of us have the choice to respond in love to God or not. For complex ideas like that, I tend to go to people who are a lot smarter than me, and one of them is C.S. Lewis. In a long quote that's on your screen, this is what he writes. God created things which had free will, that means creatures which can go wrong or right. Some people think they can imagine a creature which is free but had no possibility of going wrong, but I, cannot, but I can't. If a thing is free to be good, it's also free to be bad. And free will is what has made evil possible. Why then did God give them free will? Because free will, though it makes evil possible, is also the only thing that makes possible any love or goodness or joy worth having. A world of automata, these automatic people of creatures that work like machines would hardly be worth creating. The happiness which God designs for his higher creatures is the happiness of being freely, voluntarily united to him and to each other in an ecstasy of love and delight compared with which the most rapturous love between a man and a woman on this earth is mere milk and water. You can't compare to it. And for that, they've got to be free. Of course, God knew what would happen if they used their freedom the wrong way. Apparently, he thought it worth the risk. And by the way, when we say that, we're saying that the risk would equal sending a baby to be born as a sacrifice. His one and only son would be that payment. If God thinks this state of war in the universe a price worth paying for free will, that is for making a real world in which creatures can do real good or harm and something of real importance can happen instead of a toy world which only moves when he pulls the strings that we may take it is worth a price paid. This is what God is saying at the beginning. For God, he chose out of his love to give us an environment where we could choose him or not because we don't choose him that creates the hostage crisis. The incarnation was necessary. Number two in your notes today, the incarnation, our incarnation was revolutionary. The incarnation was revolutionary. I told you about this picture. It was powerful to me. I came across it four years ago. I believe this situation happened in October or November of 2013. And when I look at the image, uh, the, the, I guess the reason where the, the pistol is superimposed in the front of the image, and then you see the very real fear and the very real flight that this group of hostages is in, it's palpable. But on second look, as I look back over this picture, I realize there's something very powerful, something subtle but very powerful that made me look again 
And it makes me beg the question today, when you look at that picture, do you see Jesus? Because I do. Take a look at the picture brought a little bit more into focus. And I'm, I'm blown away that this photographer captures a little boy of Middle Eastern descent. And the way that this story rolled is that he was an unfortunate hostage. But the way that the biblical story rolls is that God, knowing what was going on, God seeing all of what was happening, he sends his one and only son under the tape to enter into our mess, enter into our problem, enter into what had come as a result of sin. And he says, this is my love for you, that I would send my one and only son to be a ransom for hostages. This is the Christmas story we often miss, but I believe the Bible is so clearly teaching it. Look back to um, the passage that we're in. We're in 1 John chapter 4. Before we get there, think of it this way. This is how we had all worked as humanity. Romans, Romans lays out in the first three chapters our plight or our response. In chapter one, it says anyone with a pair of eyes and a pair of ears can understand that this world was made by a being bigger and stronger than us. Romans one lays out this idea, just look at creation and you understand someone is responsible for this. Chapter two in Romans talks about not only what is intrinsically outside of us, but what is also inside of us. We have a moral code, a moral conscience. And even before we knew there was a God, we were living apart from what we knew was right. The Bible says that we didn't just break the law, we broke our own moral conscience in itself. We knew what sin was before we ever knew the law of God. We have a problem we have a reality externally and a reality internally. There is a God and he's not me. So what did ancient peoples do? They figured out ways they tried to appease the gods. They would do things for the river God, for the, the God of the hills, for the God of the sun, to make these gods, as it were, shine down gracious, graciously upon them. Horrific things, throwing young women into rivers, trying to appease the river God. Well, fast forward to us today. We're not those same ancient peoples. We're a lot more humane, but we still miss the point. That's what religion is. At the end of the day, religion is trying to do things to appease some kind of God out there that we can't, we know inside ourselves we've done something wrong. The scales are out of whack, so this is how we roll. We live in this world of God, if I can just get enough in the good scale to outweigh the bad scale, somehow I'll be right to you. We live in a basic sense of karma. This is kind of, even though you never say it, even though people in your world never say it, this is how they roll. And we do something, just something to keep the big guy in the sky happy. There's no difference at the heart issue of what people did in ancient times and what we do today apart from Jesus Christ. We're somehow trying to appease a God outside of ourselves and not be under his wrath. This is what your Bible says, 1 John chapter 4. Look at the revolutionary love of God. This is what it says. This is love, verse 10. Not that we love God. Not that we tried to appease him, but that he loved us. And he sent his son as the atoning sacrifice of our sins. This is love. Not what we could do to somehow impress a big guy in the sky, but instead what God did willingly on our behalf. Love defined by sacrifice. Now that image, that concept in and of itself is not revolutionary. That was what we thought we had to do. In order to appease this deistic entity, we have to sacrifice to somehow keep him happy. The revolutionary love of the God of the Bible, though, is so unique in that he does this. I'm not waiting for what you can do for me. I'm going ahead of you and doing it for you. I am sacrificing for your good, not waiting for you to somehow sacrifice for me. 
That is revolutionary. And watch this. Any religion today that you want to investigate, that you want to look into, no religion makes such a claim. Grace is the turning point. God giving to you what you did not deserve, that's what's revolutionary about the God of the Bible. That's what's revolutionary about Christmas. And as you hear this reality, hear what it said, that Jesus came to be the atoning sacrifice of our sins. Atoning is a word that's powerful because it's so much about what is accomplished in it. Think of it this way. If I see you broken down on the freeway, the 10 freeway right out here, if I see you broken down on the side of the road, I might say, you know what, I see my friend over there, or I see someone I know, I'm going to pull over and see what I can do to help. And so I'm making, quote, the sacrifice to pull over, get out of my car, whatever time I have. And I walk over to you and I say, what's wrong? And you say, I don't know. It just stopped running. And so I say, pop the hood. Let's take a look. And as we come around and look underneath the hood, if, if you've gotten to know me at all in this last year and a half, one of the things you know is that I have absolutely zero mechanical prowess. Okay? So as you and I come and look under the hood together, we're both going to look at it and I'm going to say, I don't know what any of this is. And we're both going to pull out our cell phone and we're still going to call the tow truck company. Now, I'm going to make a sacrifice to come and try to help, but for no good. I can't help you at all. Jesus' sacrifice wasn't just some kind of idea, wasn't just some attempt to do something for you. Jesus' sacrifice was the atoning the adjective couldn't be more powerful. It's the atoning sacrifice. Look in your notes for the definition of this word of what Jesus did when he met our need. The reconciliation of God and humans, this is the definition for atonement, brought about by the redemptive life and death of Jesus. The reconciliation being made right between God and humans brought about by the redemptive life and death of Jesus. Now, if that's hard to remember, one of the things that you don't use the word atonement for anything. It's like a total Bible word. It's just kind of there. But here's a way to remember it if you're ever wondering, what did that do again? What did, need did that meet? Look in your notes. It made us at one meant. When Jesus came in our place, he made us, we are at one meant with God when we had previously been under his wrath. This is what the atonement, at one, we were made right. That's what Jesus came to accomplish. It began in a manger, but it was accomplished at a cross and an empty tomb. And this, this is what Jesus has done for us. This is a revolutionary love. You can say where you're at in your Bible, but look on the screen. I love this from 1 Timothy chapter 2. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Three different entities are mentioned, God, humanity, and a mediator in between them. Jesus is that mediator. And look at that last phrase. He came as a ransom for all people. I want you to feel the weight a little bit today of not only the fear of what a hostage would have felt like, but here's the weird thing. The, the mall scene from Nairobi took up a, a bunch of innocent, unknowing people and threw them into crisis. Here's the wild thing what the Bible teaches is that you are, yes, held as a, as a hostage to sin, but not only a sin, a, a sin in the world you entered into, but a sin yourself that you engage. And in this Christmas season when there's so much do-gooding, and I love that. I'm not mocking that. I love our generosity. I love our kindness. People hold open doors for others that they normally don't, but there's something in the air, and that's great. But you know you. And if you're pushing against today this reality of going, yes, I realize the world is messed up, but I don't think I'm that bad, you know different. Because your sin, you can't escape it. Every time you look in the mirror, the reality is there until you recognize what Jesus did for you. And you can know his forgiveness and his love because he took it on the cross. 
That's why we celebrate so much this great love because it frees us not only from this hostage crisis situation externally, but internally where we know what we think, where we know what we do, where we know how we act when no one's looking. God's love came to free us from all of those things. I said earlier today, I want you today to be refreshed with this great news of God's love and what it meant for him to love you. But I want to say for some of us today, it's really hard to hear. For some, it's hard to hear today because you're so busy. Throughout this message, no fewer than three times, you've already thought about what you're doing after church today. You've already thought about the Christmas party you're planning for tomorrow night. You've already thought about what gift shopping you still have to do. You've already thought about just the crazy blitz of the next week that you have leading up to Christmas where actually after that day you'll be glad because you just get to rest again. Don't miss. Don't miss this revolutionary love of God because you're so entrapped in all the distractions of Christmas. Don't get me wrong. I'm not here to finger wag about how bad distractions are at Christmas, but the reality, they can be as bad as you let them be. They can be as distracting as you allow them to be in your life. And you can miss, you can miss this great news that God has for you. For those of you, it's not so much about the fact of your busyness, it's the fact of your weariness. This has been a tough year. I don't mean the last few weeks. I don't mean the last couple of months. This year has been heavy. And it seems like loss upon loss has thundered against your shores. And you just feel as though, God, if you were here and if you love me like you say you do, I wouldn't feel this alone. I wouldn't feel this lost I wouldn't feel this discouraged. And I just want to tell you, one of my favorite names for God and one that we get to celebrate at Christmas is Emmanuel, God with us. God is present in your pain. God is here in the midst of your loss. God has never turned his back on you. He's never created distance from you. So I want to encourage you in this Christmas season, instead of the weariness of your circumstances bearing down on you instead, look to Jesus who's offered himself in a revolutionary way and know that he cares, know that he's there. For those of you, it's not about busyness or weariness, it's just routine. Real honestly, this season, you've had a few more in the past. You expect a few more to come, and you're just kind of getting into autopilot. And it's kind of like that about every part of your life. You're going to wake up tomorrow. You're going to go through the realities of a schedule of a day of work. You're going to come home. You're going to interact with a family. You're going to go to bed. You're going to do it again. You're going to do it all this next week. You're going to find a little levity on Saturday, and you're going to come back on Sunday and do it all again. And somehow, Jesus has just found a way to be added to your life somehow tags along with you and your schedule. And I want you to hear clearly today, God did not send his one and only son into the world to simply join you in your routine. He came to transform your life. And that begins when you respond appropriately to this kind of a gift. God, I don't want my routine just simply going from spot to spot, day to day, and trying to fit Jesus somehow in there, I want to follow Jesus and let him, let him dictate my routine. This is the kind of love that Jesus offers, the kind of love that he came for that we celebrate at Christmas, and a kind of love today I don't want you to miss. Finally, number three today, not only was the incarnation necessary, not only was it revolutionary, but it's exemplary. The revolution was, or the incarnation, I'm sorry, was exemplary. And getting ready for today, 
I did some research about people who are former hostages. What does that look like? How does that change their life moving forward? And here's a powerful fact that I walked away with from all the different articles that I read. Anyone who's been held hostage, it changes them. It leaves a mark. It doesn't necessarily determine a life that's completely thrashed moving forward, but it leaves a mark on them. These are people who, though they are no longer held prisoner, they're somehow still held prisoner by the memory or by the experiences that they faced. I meet a lot of people who even have put their faith in Christ, but on the other side, being liberated from that environment, on the other side seems still so wrecked by what had happened and all the baggage beforehand that it's hard to know how to live a new life in Jesus. Sandra, Sandy Foster, who was so helpful to me in putting together this, I, I, the story was, this is a message I was very excited to preach four years ago. I keep every message so I can potentially use them in the future, and I lost this one. So Sandy actually watched this message on video and transcribed over 5,000 words so we could do this today, so thank you. But along with that, Sandy shared with me when she was in a church in Pasadena, a pastor there, Pastor Lee, his son Gary, was one of those taken in the Iranian hostage situation in the early 80s. Take a look at this clip. And you may remember that. If you're too young, you've heard it in a history book, but for some of us, we lived it. And that's actually a picture. Sandy's in the picture. Pretty cool. And um, this is Gary, the pastor's son, after being liberated, watch this, after 444 days. Embassy, U.S. Embassy employees were taken captive. Gary was liberated after that and brought back to the church there in Pasadena. It was a great celebration, but I so appreciate Sandy who lived it telling me, but Gary was never the same. He lived the rest of his life in isolation and it was just a very, very challenging existence moving forward. I want you to know, if you're here today and you would say, Jesus, I recognize what you came to do, but I can't seem to live in a new light, in a new way, based on your forgiveness and your healing. I wanna tell you today there's hope. And here's why I know that. In my research, I came across some other names that you might remember storylines from a few years ago, names like Elizabeth Smart, names like J.C. Duggard. I don't have time to go into all their stories. One was held in captivity for nine months. The other one held in captivity for 18 years. Both of these upon their freedom and upon the process of working through that, guess what they've become today? They've become advocates. They become those who reach out to former hostage victims and they have said, how can I help you transition back to real life? How can I help you find healing and move forward? These are our examples, the JCs and the Elizabeths. There are examples to be a people that though we still deal with the realities of things in our lives before we knew Christ, Though he brings forgiveness and though he brings healing, we actually can be or called to be a people on mission that help other people move out of that hostage situation and move into a life that they were always designed to live, rightly related to God, rightly related to others. Here at Trinity Church, we've made that so much a part of our DNA over this last fall, the idea of being rooted deeply in the person of Christ as we're reaching out in love to the people in our world. And I gotta tell you, it's happening. I love hearing the stories, stories that you're sharing of the way that God used other people in your process, in your journey of coming to faith. And you recognize God does use incarnational love to point us to Jesus. Others of us are sharing stories where you're saying, Todd, I'm beginning to do this. I really hadn't before. I hadn't made a list and consistently prayed for people in my world. I hadn't very intentionally invested in love, in lives. I hadn't 
I'd been just kind of afraid. I didn't know what to do about inviting people to events at Trinity, but I'm doing that now. And I'm beginning to live out the love of God in the lives of people I'm working and doing life with. And you see, as we finish today, that's the point of First John chapter four. Look at this last verse, verse 11. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. I remember reading that verse a long time ago. No one has ever seen God. And I go, okay, I get that. But I couldn't understand the end. But if we love one another, God lives in us. His love is made complete in us. What does that part mean? And then a few years ago, it dawned on me. No one has ever seen God, but when they see you living out the love of Jesus, they're seeing him. I know it plays into the, some of the cliche things you've heard. You might be the only Jesus people ever meet. But I will tell you, that's what 1 John 4.11 says. When you live out the love of Jesus, people see the love of God. And we have this opportunity to be a people, to be a people who live out the revolutionary love of Jesus so that other people might see him and know him and love him too. That's what's so exciting about living a life of purpose and meaning. Look in your notes as we finish today. When we live the gospel in the flesh, in our relational world, we live like Jesus did among us. And now the unseen God becomes visible becomes visible through you and me. That's what I want to encourage you with in this Christmas season. How God becomes visible through you, through me, as we live out in the flesh, his love, his gospel. Live it out among the people that he has supernaturally, strategically placed us among. And you see, that's, that's what happened at Christmas. A ransom was paid for hostages and it was paid in the payment of a God who came and became a hostage himself. And that's what God wants to engage. He wants to use your life of intentional influence this Christmas season. Here's our now what idea that we keep in front of us throughout the week. As Jesus came to set hostages free, take that great news to the hostages in your world. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so very, very much for being a God with a revolutionary kind of love. Not the God that we could have supposed or made up in our own heads, but the kind of God that was bigger than anything we could dream. A God who went out ahead of us and met needs we could never meet for ourselves. God, thank you that you came to rescue these hostages. You came to rescue all the hostages of the world, including those in our relational worlds. And God, help us to be a people of incarnational love this year. If you're here today and you would say, Todd, I've, I've never really responded to that love, but I know I need it. When I look in the mirror and I'm just honest with myself, I know I'm a hostage to sin. I can't get away from it. I run from it, but it's right there again. And the Bible says that it begins with admitting. Admitting that you're a sinner who needs a savior. Be believe. Believe that Jesus is the only savior available. Believe that he lived a sinless life, that he died a sacrificial death. He was raised supernaturally on the third day. See is choose. Choose to say, Jesus, I need your love and forgiveness, your ransom paid for me, and I want to live a life after your example in my relational world. You can make that decision before you get out of your chair today, and my prayer for you is that you would. Father, thank you for not just loving us in a sentimental way, but for proving it, for showing it, for being, sending the atoning sacrifice for our sins. We love you and we pray in Jesus' great name, amen.